Thanks for coming along tonight, and thanks to those on Zoom as the Sydney Institute continues its various discussions on the voice to Parliament. Um, and tonight we've got two speakers, Sean Gordon and Anthony Gill uh, Dillon, both of whom make, um, they've been in our audiences before, but both of whom make welcome appearances for the first time as a speaker. So the topic is the voice to Parliament, two views. And I haven't worked out which orders anyone's going in. Do we know? Let's go with the way it is here. We'll go with Sean Gordon, Chief Exec Executive Officer of the Awabakel Enterprise Limited and Chair of Uphold and Recognise, and Dr. Anthony Dillon. Um, oh, and also um, Sean Gordon's also a senior fellow at the PM Glynn Institute at the Australian Catholic University. And Anthony Gillen, who, uh, Dillon, who's a, a researcher at the Institute for positive psychology and education at the Australian Catholic University and he's also an author and commentator. So we go with Sean Gordon, we go to Anthony Gillen, we go to questions, discussion. Sean, you're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. Uh, good evening, everyone. I just uh, want to say that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not a, a, a great public speaker, so it's not something that I do quite regularly, uh, but I am pleased to be here tonight. Uh, firstly, I'd just like to acknowledge that we're gathered on the lands of the Gadigal people. I'd like to pay uh, my respects to their elders, past and present, uh, and bring greetings from my people, the Barkindji and Wonkamara people, uh, and acknowledge all of you here tonight. For tens of thousands of years, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have cared for this country. The Bewarana fish traps are believed to be the oldest man-made structures on the planet. The fish traps were shared by the Nyimbar, Nyampa, Barkindji, Wonkamara, Muruwari, Wailwan, and Gamilaroi people for thousands of years. The fish traps made Bewarana one of the greatest intertribal meeting places of pre-European Eastern Australia. Despite our long and deep connection to these lands, it took until 1992 for the High Court of Australia to overturn the doctrine of Terra Nullius. I am a Wonkamara and Barkindji man born in 1970. In 1938, my great parents and 107 Wonkamara people were forcibly removed off their traditional lands and put on the back of cattle trucks, transported from Tipperbara to the Bewarana Mission. That generation and the generations that followed right up until the New South Wales Aboriginal Protection Act was repealed in 1969 were deprived in so many ways. Their right to speak their language, to practice their culture and pass on knowledge, to go to school, and even the basic right to just move freely without needing to seek permission to move off the, re off the reserves and missions. COVID gave Australians a very small insight into what it is like to have your movement restricted, to have the government overreach into your life, telling you what you can and can't do. Now imagine that went on, for, what it went on formally for 60 years and many of my family under the act of 19, 1909 to 1969. By the time I was born, my people had suffered and my family was broken. I grew up in a foster home with 42 other Aboriginal children on the Bewarana Aboriginal Mission, a foster home full of kids from broken families. The 1960s and 70s brought big changes in this country, necessary changes. In, 1960s, in the 1967 referendum was a turning point. The oppression that Aboriginal people had long suffered was being replaced by the rights agenda. Winning these rights was vitally important. It finally made us equal in the eyes of the law. My grandfather, who fought in World War II, could now enter a pub and have a beer with his fellow veterans, a right he was previously denied. But things were not equal. Our starting positions were not the same. Too many people were coming from very broken places, economically, socially, spiritually, and culturally. Many of our families were left shattered after decades of failed laws, which include the cruelty of separating children from their families and being reminded that we were a lesser race of people. So when we won the same rights as everyone else, what we also saw was a rise in harmful social dysfunction. Peter Sutton's book, The Politics of Suffering, details the unintended damage from having a tunnel vision on rights, which robbed our people of the thing we need to be doing as we gain these rights, taking responsibility. As the saying goes, we ended up having the things done to us and for us, not with us, because the rights agenda was not met in equal parts with a responsibility agenda. 
The constant effort by governments to then try to save us has created an often chaotic layer of well-meaning services funded from multiple different departments with multiple different providers without any coordination and with very limited consultation. To be clear, disadvantaged people need services. But overlay a service-driven society with a narrative of low expectations, you can see how Indigenous people end up with little personal agency or political power to solve these problems. When Prime Minister John Howard announced his intention to recognise Indigenous people in the Constitution in 2007, he spoke of the unfinished business, the special status as the first peoples of our nation, of our national identity being diminished when our citizens feel marginalised, <coughs> of the long struggle for a fair place for Indigenous people. But importantly, he believed the constitutional recognition would be the cornerstone of a new settlement. This new settlement, he argued, would, would include the rebalance of rights and responsibilities. Howard lost the election, but the commitment to recognise Indigenous people continued. In 2012, Julia Gillard appointed an expert panel that concluded we should insert a new section 116A, prohibited racial discrimination in the Constitution. This form of substantive recognition will create a new right not coupled with any new responsibility. Prohibiting racial discrimination was pushed until 2015 when a small group of Indigenous leaders in collaboration with constitutional conservatives developed a proposal for a constitutionally guaranteed Indigenous advisory body or voice. This shifted the debate significantly. It was this idea for an advisory body or a voice that was eventually endorsed by the Uluru Statement from the heart. Despite what some opponents are trying to argue, in my view, the Uluru Statement was never about progressing special rights or creating division. The modest yet profound reform empowers Indigenous people to take responsibility in their affairs while upholding the Australian Constitution. It will be up to the Parliament to decide exactly how it will get to have a say. So this change will not empower the High Court. To date, the race power has only ever been used for one group of people, Indigenous people. Shouldn't the Constitution therefore allow us to have a say when special laws are made about us? As Noel Pearson has said, isn't it our right to take responsibility? The voice will recognise the strengths and resilience of our communities who want the future to be bright for our young ones, who want economic development, to own homes, to practise their language and culture, and who want to be free to live their lives. I regard myself as a practitioner I've been privileged to work with communities for the past 20 years to develop place-based solutions to their challenges. I led the Empowered Communities, Empowered, Com Empowered Peoples uh, initiative supported by the then Prime Minister, Tony Abbott. The Empowered Communities is a, is a responsibility reform focused on resetting the relationship between communities and government, where communities step up and take responsibilities and governments step back and assume their role as enablers. I'm also the independent chair for the Barclay Regional Deal, an initiative of Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull for a 10 year approach to regional development. This place-based regional governance framework brings together all tiers of government. The Barclay Regional Deal is also a Stronger People, Stronger Places initiative, a coalition government regional governance structure. The Barclay Regional Deal creates a granular governance group who can feed up and into elected representatives. Like empowered communities, there are now Indigenous leaders sitting at the table who are stepping up and taking responsibility for their community. Importantly, government is listening and acting. There are no veto powers, just to say. Regret regrettably, governments can pull the rug from out, un out from underneath these initiatives, leaving communities powerless. This is why the voice needs to be guaranteed in the Constitution. This stop start policy making and ad hoc consultation is costly, inefficient, and in many cases ineffective, leaving Indigenous people in the broader community fatigued and disheartened. As a nation, we, we all want to see more Indigenous communities driving a responsibility agenda and leading change. There are pockets of change happening, but this change is slow. To accelerate progress, communities need to be able to tell government how to get rid of the barriers to their development 
and they need a structure or a group who is authorised to drive place-based reform. The voice to parliament can be that change if the parliament designs it as such. The local regional bodies were developed as an inter integrated part of the voice proposal for this purpose. While much work has been done over the last decade on options for recognition and how the voice might work, there remain three important elements that we must focus on if we are to win a referendum. Firstly, it seems hard to see how we can go to a referendum without detailing how the voice will work in practice. Our opponents will be able to make a log of claims and will not be able to refute and we will not be able to refute them. The Karma Langton, Langton co-design report is starting is, is the starting point for this, but it is not the end point. To engage constructively and not destructively, we need a robust process that will allow people with questions or criticism to have them dealt with and then outlined in draft legislation. It seems obvious the parliament must be at the centre of that work. There is no point having a liberal model or a labour model. The parliament needs to work in the interest of all Australians and deliver a final model that will endure. Secondly, we need to ensure that the voice model is tied through legislation to, through, to practical change and outcomes. There are many ways we can do this, including putting clauses into the legislation for the voice model to prioritise the issues that have been already well canvassed through the Closing the Gap Reform Agreement. Finally, we need the legal community to come together and test the final wording in, in a transparent way. For people to have confidence to vote yes, we need to know that the brightest legal <coughs> minds have worked together to deliver a final set of words. The Prime Minister has said, if there is a, difference, if there is a different word or a tweaking here or there, we are up for that debate. In my view, we need to have an open and transparent process to provide advice to the parliament and the public around the legal and constitutional issues that would determine the final constitutional amendment that is most viable and desirable, worth winning and winnable. In conclusion, <clears throat> we have been here for more than 60,000 years. The Bawarana fish traps, our ancient languages, our connection to country, make our contribution to this nation as the first peoples worthy of recognition in the Australian Constitution. Former Prime Ministers John Howard, Tony Abbott, Malcolm Turnbull and Scott Morrison accepted that. And only substantive recognition through a constitutional guaranteed voice is worth doing. I know there are many people out there who stand ready and who have been trying to make changes on their own in the absence of a voice. The voice can help be that vehicle for change, for taking responsibility. It is, not giving, it is not going to solve everything, but it is a start. I've seen it, I've lived it. We must win something worth winning. We also need it to be winnable. A constitutionally guaranteed voice is the best option for substantive change that can unite us, that can be the opportunity to take responsibility, that can be true recognition, and that can chart a better course, a unifying course for our nation for generations to come. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It is indeed a pleasure to be here. I'm Anthony. You've, you've uh, been introduced to me, so I'll get sucked straight into this. Look, um, I'm not here so much to, uh, not, certainly not here to oppose Sean, because I've agreed with lots of what he said. I'm not even necessarily here to oppose the voice. Um, but I will say I do have some reservations about it and, you know, if it gets up and it works and we see those practical outcomes which uh, Sean referred to uh, manifest, I will be the first to say I was wrong and I should have uh, voted for it. So for me it's all about, you know, will it improve the lives of Aboriginal people in this land? And I'll use the, the term Aboriginal and, and Indigenous uh, interchangeably throughout this presentation. Uh, you're very unlikely to hear me say First Nations or anything like that. So just Aboriginal and Indigenous. So again, I'm not necessarily opposed to the voice, but at this stage, I have not seen the detail. I haven't seen the dots joined that are going to show me how it will help Aboriginal people lead the sort of lives that most of us take for granted. And indeed, um, those, who are, those Indigenous people who are suffering most, I, like you, and rest of Australia, who have a, an enormous amount of goodwill 
for Indigenous Australians, um, uh, we want them to not only lead lives like you and I, but lead lives like the architects of The Voice, you know, uh, Langton and Calmer and, and others, whom I have a, a lot of respect for, uh, even though I disagree with them on lots of things, I give credit where credit's due. They uh, have done marvellous achievements in their, their lives. And they've done it without The Voice, they've done it without constitutional change, they've done it without a treaty and that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, my mind is uh, looking down the path of <coughs> we have seen many Indigenous people succeed, do well, not only survive but thrive. They've done it without these things. What's been the, uh, the ingredient, the formula? And we know that, generally speaking, it's education, uh, employment, access to modern services and that sort of thing. And if the voice has a, a role to play where it would, would um, get Indigenous people into situations where they're more likely to um, have access to what you and I have access to. Again, I'd be all for it. Uh, but I think it, it can be done without the voice, and that's you know not necessarily a reason to oppose the voice, but I'm just saying there's a lot that can be done now. Um, you know, basically, for Indigenous people, uh, we know that many were... You know, the secret or the formula to succeed is to, you know, like myself born into good circumstances. I don't apologise for that. Um, I have a very, I have an English mother and a very successful Aboriginal father who was not born into good circumstances. And he's an example of where you can escape. So you're either born into good circumstances or you are helped out of bad circumstances into good, good circumstances. And I like to think that in Australia, uh, no matter how bad your circumstances are, there's always someone who can help you here and now today. So, um, you know, having said that, I, I have my doubts, I will elaborate on that. And the comments I make in this speech are kind of, I'm guessing a little bit because I don't clearly know what the voice is exactly. We, we know it's something to do with parliament. It'll be advisory in capacity, that sort of thing. And I think, you know, we already have that now. And I'm not, not opposed to that. You know, we have a, a minister, you know, Minister Linda Burney. Um, and I think we do have a, a team of good people at many levels in government. Um, and certainly at, at the, the higher level, I would certainly welcome, would enjoy seeing someone like Sean, you know, just his ideas so far are very um, inspiring for me. But, you know, we already have this uh, representation, voice, whatever you want to call it, um, through Bernie's office and other levels of government. However, uh, as we know, there's a lot of disadvantage um, that characterises many Indigenous communities, often, very often in remote communities, so Australians are entitled to say, well, you know, it's not working, we need to do something else. Um, and when we talk about Indigenous disadvantage and the problems, etc., etc., and we hear buzz phrases like self-determination, the voice, treaty, constitutional change, empowerment, uh, apologies and all those sorts of things, they are very quickly seen as solutions and they may or may not be solutions. But Australians, because they have such goodwill for Indigenous Australians, they're wanting something, they're wanting to do something. And at the moment, the, the latest offering is the voice. So you'll have many Indigenous uh, indigenous and non-Indigenous people saying, yeah, the voice, that must be the solution. Okay, uh, It could be, but as I keep saying, I haven't seen the detail that's going to map out how it will be the solution. And also, as I've said, we've seen many, many examples of Indigenous people doing well without the voice, the treaty, <coughs> Etc. Etc. Uh, a major concern I have is that uh, we hear that term self determination, and you know this will be a voice from Indigenous people for Indigenous people, Indigenous people taking care of Indigenous affairs, etc. Etc. And I do have a problem with that. It's basically an us them mentality, separatism. And where I disagree with uh, some of my peers is I. I don't see the us them when I see Indigenous Australians. I just see Australians. Um, I look at my parents, one, one's Indigenous, one's non-Indigenous. I have an Indigenous family, non-Indigenous family. You know, and they're pretty much all the same um, in, in terms of their input and in helping me through life. And so when I'm seeing more broadly the country, across the country, I like to see more of an us mentality. And I just have this concern that the voice will further reinforce this us-them mentality. Um, and it gets done under the label of self-determination. For me, self-determination 
is something that's applied to individuals. Individuals can exercise self-determination. So if I decide to get fit, uh, I go to a gym, see a doctor, get a checkup. That's me taking the initiative, getting help from other people. Uh, and I, I will see the gym instructor, the doctor. I don't care what nationality they are, so long as they're competent. When self-determination is defined in a collective sense, uh, at a group level, where it's Indigenous people need to receive services from other Indigenous people, I have a problem with that. I don't outright oppose uh, Indigenous services. There's many good ones out there, but if there's this, this insistence that Indigenous people are best served by Indigenous services, I do have a concern about that because there seems to be this underlying assumption with... Uh, not just the voice, but Indigenous affairs for as long as I can remember, that to understand Indigenous people, you have to be Indigenous yourself. And I strongly disagree with that, okay? Uh, the commonalities between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Australians far outweigh any differences. And so if we look at those commonalities, we all have the same basic fundamental <coughs> needs. So again, I don't oppose Indigenous people playing a significant part but just being Indigenous alone does not make you an expert on all things Indigenous. And indeed, we know that Indigenous people, when it comes to Indigenous affairs, can disagree strongly on, on proposed solutions and that sort of thing. And there's nothing wrong with that. Same thing happens for in the non-Indigenous camp. You know, there's disagreements. So um, I do have a concern, you know, if we have a voice, uh, which voices, which people will make up that body, uh, what advice will they be Giving and how will it be different to what can happen now? I do have a concern. Well, first of all, to say that Indigenous people are without a voice is a little bit concerning when you consider, you know, they you got ABC, SBS, they seem to have a NITV, they seem to have a voice that way collectively as, as individuals like you and I as well. So, um, you know, they have a voice, so maybe it needs to uh, be clarified, okay, at the level of government, we need a more responsive body. And again, I don't have a problem with that. And if the voice is the vehicle to do that, fine. Um, but I think everything is in place there now. If we take away some of the, the barriers that are holding Indigenous people back, and I think some of those are that there's, uh, again, the insistence that Indigenous people should only access Indigenous services. Um, we know that you know a lot of the problems facing Indigenous people are for those in remote parts of Australia, and so I see that as a, remote, a remoteness problem, not an Aboriginal problem. If you were to put non-Indigenous people in areas where there's no employment, um, you're going to have the same sorts of problems. So it's not an Indigenous problem; it's a people problem there. Um, let's see. Coming back to what, what I was saying with the. Um, we already had those successful Indigenous people. I'm not saying that they didn't have struggles. You know, it's a struggle for all Australians, but it's a good country and we can, you know, everyone can achieve when we all help each other. And, you know, the, the categorising people into Indigenous and non-Indigenous could be a barrier sometimes for that. Um, we know... I've spoken about indigenous, uh, education, employment, and that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, if there's a part of Australia where there's a high proportion of Indigenous people uh, and you need Indigenous people advice, that's great. Uh, we already have that, so I'm not opposed to that. Uh, one of the concerns I do have is, another concern is, the voices I've been hearing so far very often you know, through ABC, SBS, et cetera, et cetera, is that the problem holding, or the barriers holding Australian Aboriginal people back is systemic racism and colonisation, which I disagree with strongly. And it's just possible that, uh, depending on the makeup of the, the committee, the voice, whatever it's going to be called, could be pushing that same message. So uh, if we do have a, a collection of people, I would like to know what sort of message they were going to give Indigenous Australians what they see as being the underlying problems um, and what they see as being the, the pathway to success, prosperity and that sort of thing. What, how am I going for time, Gerard? Uh, you got about five minutes. Five minutes, yeah. Um, 
Okay, do I have anything else to say? Uh, no, other than, you know, we... Oh, what, what I should say too is I disagree with some of my uh, colleagues and peers that are opposing The Voice, so I'm, I'm happy to go on the record that I do not see The Voice as a uh, an apartheid system. I do not see it as a racist machine. Um, and I think it's wrong to say, well, if The Voice comes in, uh, it'll be racism, it'll be apartheid, etc., etc. I think that's far too strong. So I oppose some of my, my peers and colleagues who say that. Um, I think that's pretty much that's all, I, all I want to say. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity. It's been a pleasure speaking with Sean, whom I've met once before, and I hope that we get to meet uh, many more times because I think you know, very much we are on the same page in a lot of things. So, thank you. So both of our speakers um, finished within time, so we have quite a bit of time, but we'll finish when we finish, and so we're coming to questions and discussion. If I get you both up here, stand on either side and talk to the end of the room, and we'll, uh, we'll get underway. I'll operate this part of the room here, and I'll be operating that part of the room there. And please um, don't, don't stand in front of the camera if you're asking a question. Just move in closer together. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> or, 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 or a marriage? Or, 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 is it a marriage? A marriage. <laughs> the way in, the way in before the fight. Yeah. <laughs> I was, uh, I voted in the 67 referendum. Um, and as you know, there was no official no case. And there was virtually no debate. In 67, the debate was really over the um, the way that it should be replied between the House of Reps and the Senate. It had everyone had simply assumed, and rightly so, that the that the Indigenous issues, the two issues, uh, that issue would get through, and it did. What would be the consequences of a negative vote? Um, do you think? And as you know, a lot of referendums go down. Would it matter all that much? Would life go on? Or would it make a change if there were a negative vote? I mean, there may be a positive vote, but what would be the positive, the, the consequence of a negative vote? Uh, if so, if it doesn't, if it doesn't get up, yeah. Um, well, hopefully, then we could st still get on with doing uh, what we know works. You know, education, employment, opportunities, and that sort of thing. However, I suspect um, for the no people, uh, they'd be looking for you know a similar. A vehicle, perhaps uh, you know, different manifestation of this representative body. Perhaps that's what I'm guessing might happen. And your guess, uh, sure. Look, I, I, first of all, I, I think the process that we're going through has been very important. That if if we weren't going through this process of recognising Indigenous people in the Constitution, we wouldn't be here tonight. You most likely wouldn't be out seeking these types of conversations to learn more about the challenges facing Indigenous that, that Indigenous people face. Um, the, the reality of a uh, an, uh, a loss at a referendum, yes, it'll have an impact. Let's not let's not get wrong about that. But it'll also remind us where we're at as a country in regards to what the relationship is with Indigenous people, which means then that we've got a lot more work to be done. There's there's a lot more work to be done. Um, Yes or no isn't going to address Indigenous disparity and, and disadvantage. Um, but I can tell you if we, if we were successful at a referendum, uh, the opportunity to be able to put greater structures in place that do empower Indigenous people with a stronger voice to be able to take charge and lead on the ground um, is better than what we currently have. Um, but the outcome of a no campaign will have a negative impact. Um, but more importantly, I think it will uh, drive more people the people sitting in this room, the politicians and other others, to then look at what they need to be doing um, to take a greater lead in this, because we can only put up one option. I'm not hearing what the other solutions are to this, given that we've been in this place for a long time. Anthony, I've got a question. We'll come here in a minute. A question from... Just come up to the microphone. Um, a question from one of our people on the Zoom call. Do you believe the voice will help to improve closing the gap health indicators? Look, uh, at this stage, I haven't seen... There's certainly that wish that it will. I haven't seen the plan that will map out how, how it will. So uh, at this stage, I would have to say, while I'm still open to be convinced, I'm not convinced at this stage. 
that it will. Um, yeah. Simple words? Yes. I'm privileged that I, um, as I said, I've led the Empowered Communities Initiative from its inception uh, up until I stepped away from that in 2019. That was an initiative led by Indigenous people around the country to change the relationship between Indigenous communities and government. I'm currently the chair of the Barclay Regional Deal and working on strengthening the voice of Indigenous people. Um, and if we just look two, two weeks ago, Jacinda Price led a march in, in Tennant Creek um, dealing with issues of violence and so on in that community. That march wasn't led by government, it wasn't led by politicians. It was led by two Aboriginal women in that community. Our responsibility now is to work out how do we give those two Aboriginal women a voice to continually carry forward that work and how do we ensure that politicians, bureaucrats respond to the needs of the community based on the work that those two Aboriginal women done. Uh, that's, the, that's the work that we have to do. In regards to closing the gap, um, I stopped going to closing the gap addresses because I'm sick of hearing about the despair of our people. I'm sick of turning up to that, that um, first speech or first um, launch in Parliament every, at the beginning of every year telling me that we're not addressing disparity in Aboriginal communities. We've been doing that for 10 years, but we've not changed anything about what we're doing in regards to the solutions. So how can we continue to turn up year after year, listening to a disparity report, but not actually change what it is we're doing to address disparity? And if one of the elements that's missing from that to address Indigenous disadvantage is to give Indigenous people a voice and a say in what's impacting on them, then why not take the leadership and, and take that step to allow Indigenous people to lead in that space? Because I can tell you, since 1969, uh, 1967, we haven't had the opportunity to lead for ourselves in that space. Sean, you, you alluded to the fact that if there was a yes vote, it wouldn't guarantee reducing the disparity. If, uh, am I right in what you, what you su sort of suggested? Uh, my, my question is really, um, uh, for all of my adult, or, or for all of my life really, I've seen federal governments uh, proposing to improve the situation of uh, uh, Aboriginal people by you know, doing, doing lots of things, and yet we don't seem to have really advanced very much, you know, certainly in the 57 years I've been alive. Isn't the key to getting this thing passed at a referendum, whatever in whatever form it's presented to the Australian people, to really um, satisfy them in four, in a majority of uh, states, uh, yeah. the, the four out of the six states or whatever the formula is, that th that disparity is going to be addressed like it's never been addressed before because yeah. of the voice? <coughs> Yep. So, so what I'm alluding to that, it, that if we don't get the mechanics right, we don't get the architecture right and the design in regards to what the voice will do, and that's going to be a, a key piece to this, um, then we can't expect anything to change. What we've got to understand that there have been structures in place previously where we've had four people established in, in the Prime Minister's Indigenous Advisory Committees, um, but we haven't put the mechanisms in place to support people on the ground to drive the change. What we have to do is empower people on the ground to lead reform and lead the change necessary. Governments, to be, governments and bureaucrats to become the enablers to support the work that needs to happen. If we put the right mechanisms and structures in place, then absolutely a voice to parliament will make a difference. Um, but if we're just looking at you know, something, something that um, is symbolic, um, then we can't expect that change will, change will happen. The other important element is that we can't expect that we're going to turn this around in five years. It's taken us well over 100 years to get to this space. It will take us another 100 years to turn this around to where Indigenous people uh, are thriving uh, in the two worlds. And Anthony, do you want to make a comment on that? Yeah, um, look, I the mechanism that you talk about, yeah, I'd like to see detail about that. And again, uh, if I hear what that is and I'm sold on and you want to call that the voice, I would say, yeah, I have no problem with it. I would support it. Um, you know, I suspect whatever shape that mechanism is going to take, there's going to be ideologies involved. Uh, we've referred to that a little bit, you know, so, some saying that only Indigenous can speak for or uh, help Indigenous people, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, You know, will there be a focus on remote urban divide? That sort of thing. Question, yeah. Just say um, on both of you, um, 
looking at this from a historical perspective, I mean, the, the referendum to um, destroy the Communist Party or to make it illegal in the 1950s went down because Bert Evett uh, was able to argue that it would do things that would impact people that it wasn't meant to do. And at the moment, I think the problem with this whole proposition is that we don't know what it's going to do. Exactly. So if you are going to define what it's going to do, and it seems to me we're jumping from symbolism and grand thoughts on one hand, which is the Constitution, to practical things like what do we do with the terrible things going on in some Aboriginal communities, there doesn't seem to be any connection. So if you're going to design the question, what do you say to people that will make them realise that this actually can work. Okay. Because right now, what we don't know is what I think will probably make it fail. Well, just very quickly, I think we all agree on the outcomes, what, what the outcomes we want, but exactly how will that be achieved? Yeah. Uh, different, people, achieved? different people have different opinions. Can be a little bit clearer on the question? Well, for example, if you go into the Constitution, you're involving the High Court. Is the High Court going to bring down decisions which are wonderful in the sense of the law but start messing up people's lives? And we have this problem with environmental law. I mean, where, where with the best of intentions, we end up holding up projects for years and years and years because the court isn't feeling responsible. They're just giving their legal interpretations. So what I'm saying is when you have a notion of the voice, firstly, you both know that Aboriginal communities are all very diverse. They're like Australians everywhere. They all have different hopes and dreams. So what I'm saying is how do you make it specific as to what this voice is going to do? And, and that again comes in the detail and making sure that the, the structures, what you'll find right now is communities, Aboriginal communities across this country are already organising themselves. Uh, they're already going through processes to establish regional voices, um, to give cause to the challenge, challenges that they're dealing with in each of their communities. Uh, I've had the privilege of working with eight of those regions around the country with the empowered communities, which went from working with communities right here in, in the um, Redfern and La Perouse communities to the Arnhem Land communities to the MP Wildlands. These people know the issues, they know the challenges, they're coming up with their own governance structures. The way in which they plug in and feed into the voice um, will, be, will, will need to be in the design mechanisms. In the empowered communities, we establish what we call a power board. That means that we allow for each of the regions to establish what structure works for them, whether it's a cultural structure, whether it's a, uh, a, uh, a more modern structure based on uh, organisations. Uh, it needs to recognise that there are very strong natural leaders in the, in the communities, there are very strong cultural leaders in communities, but there are also very strong organisational leaders in the communities. It's not my job to tell a community how to organise itself. That is up to the communities. Our job then is to work out how does that community plug into a system um, to ensure that their voice and their concerns are being fed up into, into the parliament. What we're also saying in regard to this process, and, and nowhere from the Uluru Statement or even up to the uh, position that the Prime Minister put out at Gama, as Indigenous people advocated for veto powers. We advocated for uh, the concerns to be heard, and for governments to then look at how they respond to those concerns. But there is nothing in there that is advocated um, for us to have veto powers or say over um, government decisions. And I think uh, Greg Craven, when he was here, made the point that, in his view, this would never get to the High Court. OK. Anthony, do you want to make a comment? Uh, about that? No, no, um, about the general point that was made. Uh, no, I think I said what I wanted to say before. Um, just, look, just, just very generally, um, to address the problems facing the Indigenous population or those sectors of it that are not doing well is going to require some tough decisions and hard work to do. Uh, now, if the voice can facilitate that, great. Let's let's hear the detail. Um, but we, sh you know, we should be working on the assumption. Okay, we need to take action today. And what are the actions that we can do today? There's a question down there. Yeah, down there. Perhaps not a question, perhaps a, um, just an observation to both of you. Um, the 
Little Children Are Innocent report is over 15 years old. It's over 15 years since that report. And not one particularly Aboriginal on either side of this debate, and there are plenty of Aboriginals out there with a lot of uh, ability and influence, not one of them has made the slightest bit of difference. For all intents and purposes, the problems identified in the Little Children Are Innocent report over 15 years ago are very, very serious, and they're still there. Okay. I leave the point. So the question about a response to the Little Children Are Innocent report, which I think was brought down by uh, Ms. Gordon, was that? Anyway, keep going. Oh, um, you know, the differences would have been made to individual lives, some individual lives, but certainly as a whole, yes, we still have the same problem. And we read about this in the newspaper from time to time. Um, so again, to fix those problems, where you, you know, you're dealing, uh, often dealing with places where you have those problems of poverty, uh, no employment, a lack of autonomy, that sort of thing, is, as has been said, isn't going to be fixed immediately. And, you know, a lot of Australians want to see that, you know, we all want to see those problems uh, fixed, Sean and I. And, you know, I think we can start on that today to make it um, gather momentum and see improvement on a mass scale. But again, it does require tough decisions and hard work. And some of those tough decisions do include for remote communities uh, let's look at their long-term sustainability. Do we keep them propped up on welfare or do we uh, introduce sensitive exit strategies uh, where those communities are, you know, dissolved, combined, you know, or whatever? And, you know, th these are tough decisions which people often don't want to talk about. Sure. Yeah, so the, the children, the, the Little Children a Sacred Report, I think, is, um, you know, if we think about <coughs> what did come out of it, um, the major the major decision that came out of it was the Northern Territory intervention. Um, the Nor Northern Territory intervention introduced, uh, let's use COVID for an example, a, a system of COVID that put people on a Aboriginal people on a, on a basics card, uh, that put them in separate lines within the shopping centre so that they can be humiliated and uh, and ridiculed uh, in regards to a card that only allowed them to withdraw 20% of their income for cash. Uh, and the rest had to be spent on, on food and groceries. Um, the alcohol restriction bans uh, have only just been lifted in some parts of the Northern Territory. What it did introduce was a whole range of punitive measures. What I've learned in my work in Aboriginal communities is punitive measures don't address social challenges in communities. Communities need to be empowered to be able to respond to the challenge. As I said in the Barclay region, in the Barclay region two Aboriginal women have led um, the... Uh, work on uh, family violence within the Barclay region. Not governments, not politicians, but two Aboriginal women. Our responsibility is, how do we get behind those two women? How does the Barclay region support those two women at all levels of government? <coughs> how do the bureaucrats support the findings of that report so that that community then can move to the next stage of coming up with solutions for them? What the Little Children Sacred, uh, uh, Little Children Sacred report did was blanket the whole of the Northern Territory into a report. We need to get back to place-based solutions to communities so that they can respond to the issues that exist in their communities because it assumed that we were in homogenised communities and that blanket solutions is the, is the way to address those problems. Blanket solutions will not address the challenges that exist in Aboriginal communities. We have to go place-based and we have to ensure that those people are empowered with a voice uh, to be able to drive forward when there is pushback or when there are blockages. And I can tell you a large bulk of the blockages come from government and not from Aboriginal communities. In my experiences, that's where the blockages exist. Uh, hang on, have you got, Mark, have you got the call? No. So my question is directed to Sean in the first instance. Recognising that the statement from the heart and the Prime Minister's draft referendum proposal both call for not just a voice to parliament, but a voice to executive government. Is it conceivable that the institution that emerges could involve itself in a process not unlike what happens in the United States, where judges of the High Court 
could be subject or you know nominees effectively could be subject to a consultation process in public in the way that occurs for Supreme Court justices in the United States. So as a part of as a part of my role, I sit on the two committees that have just been announced by the minister, uh, the referendum working group and the rec referendum campaign group. Uh, I'm not a constitutional expert. There are much more. Um, there are much smarter people out there in regards to this. Um, Greg Craven sits on the Uphold and Recognise board with me. I advocated at that committee to ensure that there is a, a group of constitutional experts established to work through the issues that you're talking about. I'm pleased to say, I may be a little bit early in this announcement, um, but there will be an announcement by the Minister um, indicating that that uh, constitutional expert group have been established. Uh, and they will work through the challenges around the questions and ensuring that all decisions, uh, all decisions don't sit, uh, all decisions are uh, comfortably sitting in Parliament uh, and not decisions for the High Court. Just before we move to Anthony, you may, you may want to say, but can you tell us the difference between the two groups you're sitting on? Just what which group does what? Uh, yeah, so the, the, the working group, I guess, are working through the... the, the Technicalities of the uh, of the referendum, looking at everything from the question, the, the question that you've just asked, and now and what are the best processes for moving that forward? Um, the recommendation was that an expert group be put in place, so that is that is one thing. Uh, it's also looking at uh, how do we uh, then work uh, with all of the other challenges around that. So what you know what needs to happen in regards to. Um, the existing constitution to allow a referendum happen, um, what needs to happen in regards to questions um, uh, and making sure that the question is clear and understood, not just by non-Aboriginal people, but um, by Aboriginal people as we move forward. Uh, the larger group is more of a, uh, a group to come together to uh, activate, I guess, and, and work with Aboriginal people to, for them to clearly understand, which is, and when I say larger group, it's about 60 people. Uh, to work with them to better help them inform their communities on the ground as to what a voice is uh, and how that will uh, work to help improve their circumstances. Thanks. Anthony, do you want to make a comment at this stage? No, that's fine. Okay, so the question here. Okay, just come back to the... Thanks very much, gentlemen. I've just got a practical question. The timeline that, um, Sean, you're looking at for the work that you're doing... Um, can you let us know a little bit more about that? And is it a case that the voice to parliament, the, the constitutional change will become simpler and simpler and simpler as we go through this process rather than more complicated? So, so the timeline, I think the, the, the Prime Minister made clear that he, that he wanted to go to a referendum within, within his first term of, um, of government. Uh, and so I'll leave that to the, the Prime Minister to work through exactly what that is. The aim is, I, I don't know if it's about making it simpler, but I think it's about making it, uh, getting it to a position where uh, Australians are comfortable that they're, they're wanting to support um, the question for an Indigenous voice. Uh, and so I, I think what's been put up um, by the Prime Minister is a great starting point. Uh, he, he has been clear, it is a starting point uh, and very open for... Um, people to be able to um, provide advice in regards to that. I think the most important thing for, for me, as I said, is that the uh, establishment of the expert panel, um, I think they will be able to work through and understand how do we make this, um, uh, how do we get to a point where this question can be accepted by all Australians to be able to comfortably then go to a referendum. Uh, did you want to come back? Okay, so there's a question. Uh, Anthony, I, I just sort of um, ask you a bit about your your comment when you say some of this, some of these issues, they're not indigenous issues. So you say, for instance, it, it's an issue of remoteness. Often, yeah. Um, I see your point there. You're right. Like, if if any of us were living in these remote places, we would we we would have the same sorts of problems, right? But it does seem to me that that the analysis you offer there sort of forgets that it's more complicated in the case of Indigenous people, right? So if you're a, if you're a Yolngu person, you've got this, 
you feel this special connection to Yonggu land, which is basically is remote, right? And and it's not just a coincidence that you happen to live there. It's not just a random... So, so it's not just a sort of arbitrary thing. And the fact that seems to make the connection there between like issues to do with remoteness and Indigenous people a bit closer than you suggest because, because often it will be the case that, that say, the Yongu people, they, they, it's not just an arbitrary thing where they go to live. Yeah, they could live somewhere that's closer to services and life would be different for them, but they feel that they've got this stewardship of Yongu land that means that they have an ob- you know, they feel they've got an obligation to live there, which none, none of the rest of us feel, right? For the rest of us, just opened us to live wherever we want. And that does seem to suggest that, yes, you're right, some of this has to do with remoteness, but sometimes issues of, of being Yongu are closely bound up with issues of remoteness in a way that just saying, well, it's really about remoteness, not about being Indigenous, seems to sort of not not quite capture the seriousness of that connection. Sure. And I, I did use the word sensitive before when I said exit strategies. I'm not just saying just rip the people up from the land and place them in urban settings. And yes, in some places, uh, these connections with land, attachment to land, are very authentic for the people. They're real. And no, I would not want to rip them up from the land. However, I would like to... Um, give opportunities for their children to let them know, um, you know, their parents aren't going to be around forever. But, you know, these are the sorts of opportunities and it can start with boarding schools and that sort of thing. And, um, you know, I remember Stan Grant spoke about it once, you know, about 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago. He was just saying in these remote areas that hard decisions need to be made, but we are looking at... uh, Putting in, in the case of his own family, he said, you know, his father had to move around to get work. And we do have to uh, look at what is a sensible and sensitive exit strategy where at least there's some sort of gateway to modernity so that people have access to those things. And also, uh, something to get us thinking perhaps is if you were to go back a couple of hundred years, travel back in time, get an Indigenous person living on the land who has that attachment, connection to the land and is living off the land, caring for the land and being cared for by the land, give them a crystal ball and say, this is what your great-great-grandchildren are going to be living like in 2022. What do you think of that? And I think they would be very, very upset. Um, So that doesn't necessarily give us a solution, but it does give us a motivation for, hey, we've got to do something about the... uh, these places which are are worse. But yeah, I do take your point. I'm not saying just uh, rip them up from the land where they do have that connection to it. We have to think about it very, very carefully. Now, if the um, those places are sustainable, um, and I would be all for government pumping in a few million or billion to um, build up enterprise and that sort of thing. And I said recently, what we need is a, a minister for remote affairs if we have, you know, rural and remote development if we don't already have it. And certainly someone like Warren Mundine would be a good person to be involved in that. Um, and my brother here. So, um, so I hope that addresses your question, goes some way towards addressing your, your question. Do you want to make it comment? Well, I think the most important thing i found is, you know, again, working with those empowered communities region, whether you're on Yorta Yorta country, um, Nyongu country, whether you're in the MPY lands, um, over in the over in the, the, the Kimberley and so on, uh, is working through how do we empower people to be able to sustain themselves on their land. Um, in emerging markets at the moment, there are, there are many opportunities. I, I chair the Commonwealth Bank's Indigenous Advisory Committee and, and sit on their CEO, the CEO Advisory Board. We've reached one of our biggest procurement agreements with an Aboriginal community around reducing carbon emissions. Um, a remote community in Cape York. There are, there are new opportunities um, that weren't there 10 years ago, 20 years ago, to allow Aboriginal people to live on land. The work that I do in communities is to, I drive a development agenda, but the development agenda is purely is focused on three elements, cultural, social and economic development. And it's working through how do we address all of those three challenges that allow a community to thrive. Uh, and, the, and the three can coexist. But if there are people that choose to not want to work in a mining company because they feel that it destroys their, their country and they're not comfortable with that, 
then how do we then invest in them doing the, the um, revegetation type work and the rehabilitation type work? Uh, it, it doesn't just mean that mining is, you know, mining is one opportunity, but we've got to look more broadly at all of the opportunities that exist. In all of these communities there are essential services. I developed a proposal many years ago around educating and training our people up in essential services. Police, fire, ambulance, school teachers. When I go to these Aboriginal communities, who are in the jobs? Non-Aboriginal people are the police officers, who are the fire people, the ambulance people, the nurses, um, the teachers. The jobs are there, the jobs exist. Um, but we're not employing local people to, to sit into these jobs. And so when I look at the, the, the current state of circumstances in the same Tenor Creek at the moment, um, school attendance in primary school is 50%. School attendance in high school is 20%. Why aren't we changing the way in which we engage these kids in these education programs and engaging local people who have got the skills and the capacity to be able to train them up to work with their own people and their own kids to educate them and support them? Instead, we keep flying people in and flying people out in essential services. But one thing I've learned in Aboriginal communities, the one constant, regardless of what community you go to, is Aboriginal people. They're not going. These are their traditional lands. They're staying onto these lands. How do we support and sustain them to stay on these lands? We need to get smarter. and We need to be able to give them a voice to be able to start making decisions at a local level to drive their agendas because they have the solutions. Just a final quick uh, response from both of you. Um, I think the Prime Minister said that the referendum will be held in the financial year 2023-2024. So it could be uh, a year and a half away or it could be closer than that. So in that period, what will you both be doing and what will you um, be working on and leading up to that period from the various perspectives you're coming from? So who do we start with? We started with Sean, so let's start here with... Uh, well, for me, it'll be business as usual. Hopefully, I get to come to events like this. So I'll be making my views known uh, about the voice. But uh, more generally, I, what I hope to see in the lead up to that is more of what can be done now. The, like you've mentioned some success already. I'd like to see more of it. And more importantly, I would like to see those stories publicised. Okay? Mm. I would like all... And, you know, probably a lot of you didn't know about those things. <coughs> so we need to... And this can be done while the voice proponents are getting their, um, their act together. You know, publicise these stories, let people know that you know, there are solutions that can be introduced, there are solutions that can work. So uh, we need more of that. Sure. Uh, well, for me, nothing changes. I've been the chair of Uphold and Recognise for the last seven years, and uh, we've been working in this space, um, uh, continually you know, speaking to those on the right and bringing them on the constitutional journey. Um, we've you know, we just held a meeting this afternoon. Um, tomorrow we're off to to Melbourne. Then we're off to Brisbane for a couple of days to to, to speak to people. Uh, and I and I don't this this the challenge for me. This is a passion piece. It, it's something that I genuinely believe in. Um, I want to get back to business at some point, and and I'm, I'm building trying to build a business and get back to family at some point. What I can say since the Prime Minister's announcement at Gama. Um, the work and the effort has increased substantially in the last um, in the last few months. Uh, I guess my call, my call out to all Australians is become educated, become educated about this issue. Um, it is about the referendum. It is about amending the constitution. I think Australia is a great country. I love I love the country. I think we can be a greater country if we recognise the rightful place of the, of the people who have had 60,000 years in this country, if we put structures in that empower those people to be able to lead and take charge of the things that we're responsible for, not governments, not bureaucrats, but the things that we're responsible for, that empowers our people to support their kids to get to school, to get to universities, to get into jobs, um, no different to what I've done with my, my kids. I work hard, coming from a foster home, I work hard to ensure that the trauma that I experienced doesn't carry on to my kids, but I've taken the responsibility to do that as their father and as a, as a parent. How do we ensure that others have the same opportunity and are empowered to do the same things for their kids? That's our responsibility, not just me as an Indigenous Australian, but all Australians, to make that change. Many thanks. Just
So, uh, it's in the Institute uh, all about debate and discussion. We don't have formal debates, we have discussions and we hear different views. And today we, the topic was the voice to Parliament, two views, and we heard two considered views. And we'll hear, we'll hear more of these in the, in the months, uh, weeks and months to come. But for tonight, uh, many thanks to Sean Gordon and to Anthony Dillon for a great performance each. Thank you very much.